Welcome to the Holy Spirit's Curriculum of Joy podcast. My name is Wanaka Oberhuber, and I'm your host. My guest today is Mike Ulmer. Hi. Hi, Wanaka. So nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. I'm sorry you can't uh, see my face. I've been joking that it's a real crime, but uh, that uh, no one can see my face, but I'm glad to be here. Yeah. We, we can have our conversation, and I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. So let's start with the a question I like to ask. How did you get to seeing the world the way you do today? Well, I, I, I think like everyone, it's a, it's a kind of a conglomerate of our, of our experiences, both the good and the bad, uh, blended in with the background. And, uh, and then a whole lot of voodoo thrown in as to, uh, as to whether that's good fortune or uh, empirical design or all those things. Uh, but I would, uh, the short answer to your question, I suppose, is just by stumbling through everything that brought me to this moment. Would, would you like to give us some examples? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, so I, I guess we're all the, the um, fundamentally, we're all the, ex the experience we all bring forward for the longest time, just by virtue of time, is our childhood experiences. And so my childhood experience was when I was very young, I learned that there was great uh, fun to writing because it brought with it a certain approval that was really neat when I was just a young kid. And so really, I've been chasing that ever since. Uh, and I've managed to monetize it. So uh, I've made it my living to uh, to write and to help other people write. And on the way, I wrote a lot of books and kids books. And and uh, and uh, I had a great career as, as a sports writer and covered a big hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, I, we're getting a lot of great players, as a matter of fact, from Germany. I want to go, but um, the league is rather than the Maple Leafs are. But I covered the Leafs and, and had a great career writing books and still do. I help people write their books and it's very rewarding. great to hear that you started writing as a young boy and uh, got a passion for it at that age. Yeah, and it really evolved into my only only real uh, career, only um, only marketable skill. <laughs> because uh, uh, because really it is, is the one thing that I find I can do pretty well. And not that I can't do a lot of other things pretty well, but uh, it's been the easiest thing to monetize. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's fun to do and it's, it's w even more fun to help people do. So you might want to explain some of the ways you help people to write and how you have found joy in writing and what, what triggered that joy in the way you write. Well, the biggest joy in writing is being done. <laughs> I have a very ambivalent relationship with writing. Uh, and so there's a great a saying by a very wise woman named Dorothy Parker, who said that uh, I, I, I loathe writing. I love having written. And, and that is it. It's very satisfying for it to be done because it, the, the funny thing about writing is the more you learn, the harder it is um, to be satisfied because you, you just quite naturally have learned things that, mean that you don't really want to fob off what you've just learned and and give something that's not as good as it could be and since you learned something 15 minutes ago that was actually helps you make it better it's a it's a constantly evolving hill like it's a horizon that just keeps on rising every time you get over the next one so when you're right you have to be ready to to, to live with that it's uh you know there's also another saying that says you don't finish your book you surrender them and and that's that's the thing about a book. And a book is kind of a almost a mystical experience if you can if you can use it that way because it exists in some form already. It it you just have to. It's not that you're building it; you're unearthing it, and you're finding the elements and the roots of your story. And that part requires often requires some help, and that's what I like to do. Um, but 
there's uh, if you if you wrote the book you set out to write you wrote the wrong book because you haven't incorporated the experiences came between when you decided to write the book and when you wrote the book it's uh, it's an extraordinarily challenging thing and it's a little bit Monica I make the example that it's a little bit like being in love you think you're in love the first 15 times you have a crush on somebody and then the 15th time you experience what real love is and then you know that you were wrong the previous 14 times <laughs> And that's what finding your book is about. You thought you knew before, uh, but you don't. And you uh, eventually you find out what that thing is, and then you finally uncovered it. And that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Yeah, that's an interesting concept because I'm sure there's various approaches to writing one's book, and some like to plan it in ahead and yeah. do all that like a scientific book, right? And others like to research <laughs> and and others like you like to be surprised while writing <laughs> i think that's it that's how it should be if it's going to be a continual source of surprise to the reader it should be a continual source of surprise to you <laughs> your spirit your spirit and your experience should be somewhat akin to that that the reader enjoys and that's why it's such a it's such a great great fun to do and as i mentioned i help people write their books but the real fun, I always say that that the real benefit that I offer people is the chance to examine their life, examine what it is they do and why they do it, examine their backstory and examine what makes them different. I write business books, but examine what makes them different from everybody else that sells insurance or does whatever. And and then we'll write your book. But I the book is I'll just throw the book in. That's the that's the benefit. In a sense, it's hockey players here, like Monica, like to say that I, 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 they pay me to practice. I play for free, and and it's kind of the same way. The real benefit of someone writing their book with me is that the stuff they learn, uh, and where that takes them after the experience of writing the book, it resonates all the way. I hope through their lives because they they reach their conclusions and they, they have a new clarity about their their voyage to that point and where they want the voyage to take them after that. Not in terms of and storytelling and, and, and business and, and your personal relationships, that's very valuable. And that's really what we bring. Uh, and we'll throw the book in for free. That's great. Yeah. So the, the, the idea is that you have a finished product at the end and then you can market it right and you help with that as well or no the one thing that's that's interesting the one thing we don't do is market the book and that's um because there's all sorts of people online who will help you market your book there's just tons of people who want to who want to game an algorithm for you i like it my priority is to give you a great 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 book and and at the end of it that's that's really that's step one have a great write a great book and then worry about marketing it afterwards. You know, I remember I was listening to Steve Martin, the comedian, talk about talking to young comedians. And he says, all they want to talk to you is getting the right agent or, or this or that or online presence. And, and he says, it's, it, it, it vexes them. Get a great act <laughs> first. Worry about all that other shit later on. Get a great act. And so my advice is to write a great book. And, and everything after that will, will come through. Yeah, well, it's, it's like with with audio, with interviews and so on. If you don't have a good audio from the beginning, it's it's very hard. <laughs> it's better to have a good audio. <laughs> or a go good from video. Case. Or, or a good video, yeah. yeah. Because the ed you can do as much editing as you want. You cannot um, no. perfect it if... <laughs> product from the beginning wasn't so great yeah, bad data in bad results yeah what what types of principles do you use or what types of thought thoughts do you use to to get people to enjoy the process and and get it done I've never met anyone who didn't enjoy the process because we all like to think about ourselves and ruminate on our lives. And I've interviewed, you know, more than 10,000 people. 
and and I've yet to find someone who didn't at some level want to talk about themselves. That's how we are. We're social beings, and that's a great thing. So um, where it can get really interesting is where you make people a little uncomfortable. So your job as an interviewer is simultaneously making someone comfortable and uncomfortable. The, the comfortable thing is you want them to, to, to feel at ease. You want to generate, and this is really important, you want to generate a feeling of regard, even love, for the person sitting across from you, whether you're doing it you know, in person or, or online. That person has to sense that you have a genuine interest in them, a genuine, genuine regard for them as you would any other person. That's really, really important because once it, it's, it's reciprocal. Once someone feels that attention, that once someone feels that intention, then they themselves are bound to reciprocate. So sometimes that means uh, sharing something confidential uh, or what you might otherwise say is private with that person. And when you share something that's a little private, a little hard with somebody else, again, they will reciprocate. They will bring you to something to the table for you. It's, it's, it's a lovely give and take uh, thing. Where you have to make them a little uncomfortable is where you have to challenge them a little bit uh, on things that maybe were set values and beliefs that they have. One of the things that I find I have to do is I'll just tell people, you're not being real with me. You're not being vulnerable. No one's life is as you, you're reading me. You're giving me your LinkedIn page. You're not giving me your life experiences. And sometimes people like that. And sometimes people don't. And the end of the day, I'm like a lawyer. I can give you all the great counsel I can, but other than doing something illegal or immoral, um, I can't, you're not bound to follow my advice. So you probably have the book you want. And even if it's not, um, even if it's not very vulnerable and I can't do much about that because everything I pull out, I have to, you have to surrender, but that's really a big part of the job, making the person comfortable and feel welcomed and feel secure, but also knowing when to pull a little bit. Yeah. This issue of authenticity is a big one, right? Because I know. it's just such a bullshit word, though. Anytime someone says authenticity, I say bullshit because, sorry, I want to go. Because if you, it's like humility. If you have to say you're humble, you're not. <laughs> when people say I, I, I have a lot of authenticity, you know what? Humility and authenticity are like cousins. And if you haven't got one, you haven't got the other. So, so how do you define it then? The the honesty or, or or all these things, right? Because that's what you need in a book, right? You need to be honest. You need to be clear. You need to be sharing. You need to be vulnerable, and all exactly. of these things, so that people can relate to it, right? I think vulnerable. I mean, authentic is is a word, a pretty good one. I think vulnerable is a far better word. You know, there's always better words for for what we want to express. And authentic is kind of in fashion, I get it. But vulnerable, I think, is a, a lot more powerful because sometimes you got to give up something you don't want to share. So I'll give you an example. I, I, one of my books is about a great guy named Ron Foxcroft. He's an inventor. He's a guy who lives in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, as, as do I. And, and you know, Ron is a, just a superb entrepreneur and a really, really hard worker, like a hustler right from the get-go. And it's done him really, really well and, and there are two things that are really important to know about Ron. The first thing is he, he, he hates the, 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 the expression could have, would have, should have. You know, that's the first thing he'll tell you. He, he hates that. And he'll say, my dad said that sometimes. And, and, uh, and, and I hated that. I didn't like that. I said, okay, well, I knew that. And I also knew that Ron didn't drink. So I said one day, I said, Ron, why don't you drink? He says, because my dad drank. And he beat the shit out of me once a week until he stopped drinking when I was, you know, long since turned into an adult. And so you understood at that moment that Ron was simultaneously running away from and running towards his dad. And that key element is opened up the Pandora's box, you might say, and gave you an understanding of why Ron is Ron. Well, Ron didn't just tell me that. 
I had to ask it. I had to dig and get it and take a chance. And that's, that's the game. But that's where vulnerability is so important because that one thing that, that is kind of a painful thing to share just completely illuminates who the guy is. He did not want to be his dad. He saw those elements in his failed dad's life. He felt the wrath of his father. And he decided two things. I'm not going to be him. If that means not drinking, I'm not going to drink. Yeah, and how do you write about yourself, or do you write? You know, do you like with Ron? You write about other people, or uh, wrote, what do you like? <laughs> well, I wrote a book called uh, "Show and Tell Writing." Uh, that's available on Amazon. And the reason I say that is because I hadn't planned to write an autobiography, but the problem, Monica, is that once you've said you've advised people to be honest and to be vulnerable pretty difficult not to do it yourself. <laughs> so so I found myself having to put elements in the book that I may not have wanted to do myself. So that was the result of the book. Having been a columnist uh, for many years, column writing is sort of the, is like, really column writing is a blank canvas. When you write a column at a major newspaper, as I did for many years, it's like being on an island and, and an airplane comes over and they drop you a bottle, a parchment, a cork, and a piece of paper. And you scribble out as best you can and then you stuff the parchment into that bottle and put the cork in it and throw it out to sea and wait for the next plane. There's no limit as to what you can write. There's no meaningful editing other than correcting and stuff like that, spelling and stuff like that. So no matter what you do, your essence is going to filter into that. It's the people that... that administer that administer that the most artfully are the people that you want to read it's great that you have a great vocabulary but you want to have a sense when you read a column what that person's sensibilities are and and so it's it's a lot of times they'll just say it or a lot of times you'll have to dig a little deeper and they'll show it to you they won't say it to you they'll show it to you the things that we observe in other people are far more telling the things they tell us. It's how we're built. We're, we're built that way because we have to be able to absorb information, but we also have to be able to determine intent. So if, uh, let's say I'm talking to you and where this is many hundreds of thousands of years ago, and I direct you outside the cave and say, you know, Wanako, I want you to go to the cave. I want you to walk towards the sun. That's that big flaming thing up in the sky. And you find a large, large rock. I want you to take a smaller rock. I want you to knock a smaller rock off that. I want you to kind of grind that rock against the bigger rock until it feels really sharp. And right beside that, you're going to find some reeds. And I want you to knock off a piece of reed that's about, oh, three feet long. I want you to jam that sharp stone onto the end of that, that stick. And I want you to bring it back. And so when you do that, you absorb that information, those instructions, because that's the way we have to be. You know, that's the reason we're still here as a species. 99% of the species that once existed on Earth are extinct. We're still here because we're able to, you know, we're able to not only just take that information in, but implement it. So you come back with the stick and I'm looking at you, Monica, that's great. You've absorbed the information, but I have to be able to look at you and figure out what you're going to do with that spear. Are you going to use it on me? Are you going to go hunting? I have to look at your body posture. I have to look at our backstory. I have to look at all these things. And so when I make that conclusion, that's essential. That's a life, life or death conclusion. That flies right past my, my uh, gatekeepers into the back of my head. Can I trust Wanako? Right? Is Wanako going to do me in with this beer? I've just showed him how to do it. And so when we make that discovery about someone's values, their personality, who they really are, it's so important. So when you write a great column, you're not saying, I believe in this and that and the other thing, but you're making a case uh, through the facts and the opinion you've given in the column that leads the person reading this to go, oh, I think I know this guy. I know what he's about. I know why he chose this word. I know why this offends his sensibility. And so when you write a column, a newspaper column, it's like, Every second day, you give them a new piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So it's it's it has to be really artful, and and that's the best kind of writing. Yeah. Um. Have you written about 
discoveries you made about yourself or or other types of experiences that have formed you or how, how did you go about that? That was in my newspaper in days. So I, I would write a column. A lot of them were about very personal things. My mom and, and uh, in life, I wrote a column for a very short lived column for the Global Mail newspaper in Toronto. And I wrote a lot of different pieces uh, on for social media about my experiences and what I thought about things. So I've always sort of, that is, you're, always, you're your own source of content. The question is, how much of that do you want to share with the world? One of the things that happens, I think, in, 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 and I see this because I, I'm interested in podcasting, as you are, obviously. And a lot of people want to monetize their trauma. And that sounds really harsh. You know, I'm a survivor of this. I'm, this terrible experience has happened to me. I was hit by a car and lost my limbs. And I, I don't say this to diminish any of these, you know, obviously extraordinarily powerful experiences. And I know that when we are the product, as we said earlier in the conversation, of these extraordinary experiences. So we bring those to the table. But when you write to get things off your chest, when you write to tell your story without regard to the listener, when you give no conclusions, but instead just, just harbor on the difficulties, you do your readers a disservice. These people are giving you the most important thing they can give you. They're giving you their time and complete attention. They're not talking about their bills or their, their love life or whether the car is riding. They're giving you their complete attention. At the very least, you owe them some conclusions. You owe them some, uh, some advice. You owe them uh, something that's way, way past manifesting your own grief and your own uh, difficulties. So that's why I sometimes balk at people writing these books based on their own trauma. I get why they want to share it, I just don't get why I want to read it. Yeah, well, that's why I asked about insights, right? Yeah. About this discovery, right? Because if it's if it's just writing about how horrible things are, right, that might not be very helpful to the people listening or reading or whatever, right? So you need to, to share the insights that you derived from that and what it has, how it can benefit anyone, right? That's it. That's the difference. I think you really hit upon it, Wanako. It's it's that it's that willingness to give. Don't a story is useless unless you give me a conclusion. Help me out here. <laughs> you know, there's just so many difficult stories in the world. And again, I don't say this to trivialize any of them because I, I, can, I, I can't walk in those shoes, but I can imagine what those shoes must feel like. And it's not that I lack empathy, but the purpose of communication is not just to say how you feel. It's not just to say where you were. The, com the purpose of real communication is to engage. It's to listen. It's to, when possible, enlighten. It's, when possible, it's to educate. It's, but it's, it's that spirit of absolute um, connection. And if it's just a rant or if it's just how difficult your life is or this, the circumstances of these terrible things that have befallen you, I think it falls short. Yeah, well, I, I'm not going to – I just say that I think it's important that the way your story is told or what you tell also has your insights included, right? what it how oh, yeah. it has impacted you but um but yeah. but i guess what you're speaking of is is the idea that one um has nothing no substance to how it could benefit one another right how one could learn from it because of course you can say okay it benefits people to see okay they're having a much better life <laughs> than these people had right you could have that right but you could also say you, um, they, the person was able to overcome it and grow from it, right? And then it's but, certainly a benefit to the people listening. I mean, how many podcasts want to come about inspiring people? I want to inspire people with my podcast. Every second podcast, I want to inspire people. I want to, you know, I want to be an inspiration to people. How much inspiration do we need? Uh, I need some conclusions. Right. I think every great business book, and I, I deal with business books, every great business book has three things. 
it has a proposition that's really important to the person who's going to read it. It's going to benefit them. And that proposition can be almost, you know, anything. It has to be a little contrarian. It's often the title of your book. It's like 5,000. What's the name of the book about time, time management, Monaco? It's uh, 5,000 hours. And it's, it's about uh, time management for mortals is the, is the subtitle. It's really a great book. It's, a, it's about a guy who tells a story of how he was a, uh, an efficiency expert. And he realized there was no such thing. And he sort of took, look, took a different look at how much, they, so he started with the rather unusual proposition that we're mortal and that we only have so much time. So how are we going to manage that realistically? It was a great look, really a, an excellent book. And, but it was a great proposal. It was a great proposition. And even though it's one that we all know it's at some level, restating it in his own way made the book really, really great, great to read. But he also talked about his backstory. And you have to do that when you're writing a book like this. You have to tell how you got to this conclusion. Because if you haven't got the miles, then you haven't got the credibility with the reader. You know, I could have thought something last night that came to me in a dream, or I could have been working on it for 10 years. Which would you be more apt to believe? I'm guessing it's the 10 years. So that's really essential. You have that middle part, you have that backstory. And just as we talked about how we observe things and that makes them true in our minds. The backstory, if you show persistence or if you show ingenuity, the reader will absorb that and make their own conclusions, which is, as we said, is much, much more powerful than being told, hey, I'm clever or I'm diligent. And the third element is just, uh, sorry about this, I have to, sorry, um, doo -doo -doo. sorry, Wanako. The third element, there, I'm going to turn this down. The third element is, is, is recommendations. You have to give people something to use. So if you're giving them a proposition and you're giving them a backstory, you also have to really give them how to do those things. So lots and lots of ideas. So I'll open up for a question. Does anyone have a comment or a question they would like to ask? Okay, then we'll continue. So, Julie, what I, Julie, you must have a question. Jamuna, you must have a question. Oh, there's Julie. Okay. So go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. It's it's really inspira ins inspirational to hear you talk. I'm, you know, working on a book about authenticity and um, vulnerability. I was writing those words. I was writing those words today, so it's really hitting um, um, a really, uh, you know, a part in me because I've been kind of stuck. I've been having a hard time, you know, getting my writing flowing. I'm, I'm just been uh, there's been a resistance, um, but I think what you're saying is just so helpful because I don't want to, I don't want to. Um, talk about the pain of getting to the what what my journey has been, but about what I learned from it. So uh, it, it, that's been really helpful to me. I did wonder about what you do to help people. What is, how do you, how do you work with people to help them write their books? Like do you meet, you know, just via Zoom individually? What's the process of that? Well, so what we do is we sort of, the first thing we do is a lot of times people just want to be heard a little bit and want a little encouragement. So I have a calendar on my, uh, on my uh, website. It's uh, getcatapulted.com and Monica will obviously have a contact list for me too. So if you just want to talk about it for a little bit and just sort of, I have a 15 minute consultation. At the very least, we can send you on your way with an idea or two, Julie. If you want to sort of um, dig a little deeper, uh, what we can do is, is <laughs> this is a cheesy name. I hope you enjoy it. I call it find your brand for a grand. And we just talk and we dig a little bit more into your story and we really find what those three elements are. And in this case, what you're, what you're, your real story is and then you know and then I, I get sort of give you some ideas and then you can go on your way and the third element is is where we dig, do a real deeper dive and we talk for three or four hours and and then we sort of i i help you write that first uh opening uh chapter and then we really find out what the elements of your book are and then we create a real blueprint for you and, and how to do that and give you some kind of covers to sort of think about and have, sort of lay out a real great blueprint for how to write your book. 
to have somebody else help you with that. I know it sounds kind of salesy, but there's a real utility to have somebody else look at your life in kind of an impartial way and say, gee, Julia, I wonder if this was more important than you're giving it credit for. Or, or I wonder if, if that conversation really um, was as impactful as you think it was. And so that's what we do. That's kind of the service. We, we, uh, we get people up and running on the book with a really nice blueprint. And then we also give them the results of our, the transcript of our conversation. So in a sense, you can do a little bit of clip and paste. You can sort of just say, okay, I remember that part. So this kind of plugs in here. So it sort of helps you um, get another look at your book and sort of reacquaints you with your story. Because we're often so busy telling our story that we kind of forget what it was like to live it. Does that help? Yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. I hope good luck with your book. When you say you're stuck, um, how do you mean? Uh, it's about being afraid of putting it out there and um, being criticized or not taken seriously. You know, like I I'm worried about that. I'm anxious, I think. That's where I'm stuck. May I ask so that, you? So that it's personal work, you know, self esteem, mm -hmm. confidence, all that stuff that I'm doing, trying to get through. Can you tell me, would you be comfortable telling me a little bit more about your book? Um, sure. I'm writing two books. Um, one is called uh, The Parenting the Authentic Self, and it's a handbook. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, and so yeah. I, it's a, it, my, my, my angle is about the relationship. The relationship first with our self, the healthy, self-aware relationship of being uh, the director of our own lives here, and the, how we bring that into relationships with our children, with our spouses, with our parent, you know, with extended family, all the way through the generate, you know, like through the life cycle. So uh, the first part is about all that, and then the second part is about how do you do this with a baby? How do you do this with a toddler? How do you do this with teenagers? How do you do this with older, you know, your your parents? So that's that's the the parenting book, uh, but it's supposed to be like a practical guide kind of thing about how to do it. And then I'm writing a novel which is about self aware characters, you know, so just kind of telling the story as they go through self aware living. That's kind of what I'm working on. Well, if they if they, if they're too self aware, Julie, nothing happens. What do you mean? <laughs> well, <let's see. laughs> They say in hockey, the dullest hockey games are the ones that are that are they're absolutely perfect, where nobody makes a mistake. <laughs> I see. And if, I and see. if we're too self-aware, we miss all the interesting mistakes. Well, right. So the novel is more about the journey of the ups and downs and what happens, right, and how you get out of it, how you learn from them. But that, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Well, it sounds like you've got. What I, I, I really love about uh, the, the book about parenting is that I, I mentioned the three elements to it, and you, it sounds like you got a lot of tips, and that's really, really essential. A, a book that's just theoretical and has no practical application really isn't useful. Uh, right. So, so the idea that you have things that can help people, that's really, that's really great. You have, I don't want to say you have an obligation because you don't, but you have an opportunity. And, 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 and really because of your, your vocation or your, you know, what you do for a living, you can bring so much to the table in terms of what people have told you. So I think I got, you really have something there. I think it may take some refining. The un, listen, unsolicited advice is the only kind I ever get. So, so um, the book is there, Julie. It's not that you have to build it. It's that you have to uncover it. It already exists. Think of it that way. Think of it as, as something that already exists in its finished form. What you have to do is go through all the versions of it that aren't right yet. And the analogy I made was one I couldn't, I'm sure you heard it earlier, was being in love. You think you're in love the first 15 times you have a relationship. And the 16th time you go, oh, this is what it really is about. I'm really in love. And then you realize the first 15 times you weren't. What you're trying to do is get to that point where you're just in love with the book and you realize that this is really it. And, and that is um, really about, um, I, I think the language you used was so powerful. That is about, this is an image that I would leave with you if I can. Imagine you're just point to your head and point to your heart. 
And everything, that's where everything comes from, right? Your book comes from your head, it comes from your heart. But at your shoulder, there's insecurity. And at your elbow, there's, uh, you want to sound smarter than you are. And maybe at your wrist, there's something where someone told you a lie, like you can't write or you, your story, you're not entitled to write your story. And so what happens is that that wonderful thing that between your head and your heart runs into those roadblocks. And so it's not a question of so much altering the text. It's a question of eliminating the roadblocks because then you'll be able to have a clear view of where it is you're supposed to go. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I know the book. I know the book. Um, it, it, it is written because the work that I'm doing with my clients, the work I did with my own children, it's been done. I've done it. And and the real obstacle now, and it, and I've been working on it for a long, long time. And there's there's a lot that's done. And then now it's just about letting go of the fear of just putting it out there. So that's that's what I'm working on. And so, and so now if I came to you and you're in your, this is a dirty question, a little fast off of someone with your education and knowledge, but if I came to you with this, with this issue that I have this great book that's going to help a lot of people, but I'm, I stumble over the fact that I might get my feelings hurt uh, and, and I have to be vulnerable. What would your advice be to me? Um. My advice would be to, um, I don't know, figure out, figure out how to have self-value, you know, like, um, what would I say? You know, just give them, give them validation that they, and support and encouragement that they need to do it and it's safe to do it. And, you know, I guess I would do that. Well, I guess that's what I would offer you back then. That makes perfect sense. That's, that's what I would, I would send back. Yeah, to yeah. Yeah. There's a very loud, critical voice that comes through my head, which, you know, got implanted in me for reasons. And it, it's very loud. And I, I, I've been listening it to, it to, to that too much. So I'm kind of working to hear the real voice of truth here instead. Uh, the other thing I would, again, unsolicited advice. <laughs> my stock and trade, Julie. <laughs> The other thing I would say is that the problem with writing is that everyone, you look at so many people that do it so well, right? Everywhere you look, songwriters, movies, whatever, you see how many people that do it so well. And if, if you ever have the chance uh, to watch, there's a famous a piece of video at, at Prince performs while my guitar gently weeps at uh, a rock and roll induction for George Harrison. And Prince just absolutely steals the show. It's magnificent. It's like it's the best virtuoso guitar everywhere, anywhere. And so you tend to think that because you read great people doing great stuff, that it has to be at that level, right? But just because you can't play while well, my guitar gently weeps the way Prince does, doesn't mean you can't play a great guitar or do really great work. It's not a, how, how well they do is none of your business. None of your business. What people think of your book, none of your business. None of your business. All you're going to do is put it out. All you can do is put it out. What they're going to think is what they're going to think. You have to make your art. It'll help people if it's written with an open heart. I believe you. Oh, you're so sweet. That's the voice that says, it's more complicated than that, Mike. <laughs> I hear that voice a lot here at home with my wife and three kids. It's more complicated than that, Mike. <laughs> yeah, but but you're right, though. It, 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 it When you start doing the comparing game, you know, I, I pick up a good book and I'm blown away by it. And then I start the self-doubt cycle, you know. Like oh, yeah. My, yeah. Okay. I'll work on I that. that. Julie, I feel that every day. Every day I feel that. And, and, and that's just, that's part of the game. That's the problem of trying to do something that so many people do so superbly. But it doesn't disentitle you. You know, it doesn't. It's, you, you're not going to be Prince. Who cares? You're still going to be good, really good and really helpful. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.
Well, I might as well see if Jamu is going to speak to it. Jamu, what's questions? going on down there? She's listening. Okay. Julie, do you want to just reach over and give Julie uh, Jamu a little a little tap on the shoulder there? Can you do that for me, Jamu? <laughs> Come on in. Go ahead. Hi, Aloha. Don't um, tell me. Are you in Hawaii or are you? Where are you? I am in Hawaii. Okay. I am on Oahu. We and, are. And in, I'm in Canada, so already I don't like you. But go ahead. That's okay because you know I love hockey. My dad played hockey for 22 years. Great memories. Um, he had to hang the skate up, skates up because he has Paget's disease. But um, yeah, when I heard that, I was like, wow, right on. I love hockey. I still love hockey still. It's a big part of me. I'm originally from Philadelphia, so you know how sports are over there. Um, <laughs> you know sports. I've, um, never, I've been in a lot of buildings, Jeruda. I've never been in a building that had the bloodlust that they had in Philadelphia. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Uh, yeah. Up, the fans are so mean. They'll, they'll boo the blind kid at the Easter egg hunt. Uh, you know, we're just very um, strong. We just have a, a weird way of showing respect, I think. I think that's <laughs> a great way of putting it. <laughs> if you're a Dallas Cowboy, forgive you. We, you know, oh, God bless no, you. No, no. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know what to say besides I really enjoy um, everything I heard so far. Um, I write poetry, and I, I really want to um, publish it. I. I published thing on my page and um um and on my YouTube channel. I just do like like spiritual inspired poetry, of course, and miracles inspired poetry stuff like that. Yeah. And I really would love to publish it. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, you can publish it. There's never been a better time to do that because there are no gatekeepers anymore. There's no one, you know, before you had to work with a publisher and, and they would take one out of a thousand books, right? And now there's even fewer publishers and even more books. But there's there's all sorts of technology and lots of companies that will help you uh, publish your book. And then you can distribute it online in ways that are really novel. Now, there's there's sort of two, two people. There's two groups of people. There's those that want to see their books in, in bookstores and stuff like that. And, I, it, that's a tough one. I, I don't know how much I can do about that, but I can tell you that there's lots and lots of ways to publish and distribute your work. I, do you feel that if it becomes a book, it's more real than it wouldn't otherwise be? No, I just no. feel like like what I share would really help other people. I don't know, like if it gets more broad. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. No, I think you have a, you feel a little bit of a calling, but you're not quite moved to the point that you're willing to put it out there. There's, you know what? It's, I've always written for, it's always been my living, but there's nothing wrong with just writing for yourself either or sharing it, you know, with people that are really close in your circle. I think that's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I wonder if part of what we're talking, I was talking with Julie, isn't a little bit about what you're talking about too, Jim, the, the idea that if you, if you put it out there, you might make yourself a little vulnerable. Is that part of it? Sure. I, I definitely think that's part of it. I, I have this uh, deep, um, early ego, um, created this thing. I don't like criticism or being judged. Well, finally <laughs> someone who does. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the smartest thing anyone ever I've heard, smart, the best piece of advice is what I just shared with Julia, and it's not my own, believe me. What people think of you is none of your damn business. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to that, and I was, yeah, that's exactly, you know, I need to get past that. I think it's very liberating. I think it, it, it can be very liberating, but I'm like anybody else. I write for the love. You know, I know a lot of people that write for the, well, I write for the money, but I also write for the love. I, I want people to like what I do. And I started in grade five, you know, and I, 
and I and I, I started uh, making little compositions in school, and I noticed that it garnered me a lot of esteem from my my classmates, and 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 that just really continued. So I know just what you're saying. I I, I write for the love, and I know a lot of people that don't, uh, but I I I need it, and then, so I was just as prone as you are, and Julie are to 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 um, to being hurt. Because really, when you make yourself vulnerable and, and, and it doesn't get the desired result, it's never going to be as bad as you think it is. It's, no one's going to take this and wipe their ass with it and nail it to your door. Like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, but someone could say something hurtful. And, and I, I completely get that. And it takes great bravery to move past that. But really, I mean, I should be walking the talk and saying that I can, I can write something. But if I put something online, I'm checking it like 10 times just to see if I got any likes. I'm a love slut. So, <laughs> so I completely understand what you're talking about. And that really is part of the journey. Yeah. And then um, I get into comparing and then I'm like, oh, why do they have so much more likes than me? You know, but it's all about working past that. Yeah. Getting past that. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really all I have to say. <laughs> well, what's the, what's the weather like where you are right now? Warm. <laughs> um, it's probably uh, getting to about 82 degrees. Nice. Um, yeah, it's pretty sunny today. Uh I don't know. It's pretty warm all year round. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Yeah. So I live close to the poly. Sometimes it rains because yeah. it's like a valley, but um, yeah. it's pretty. It's nice. nice. Sounds pretty ideal. Yeah. I. It's expensive here, but it's beautiful. I hear that as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here and i really enjoy your sharing well, thank you for for uh for joining the conversation and julie as well so mike is there any particular advice you have for for the people who are writing what they um spiritual books or what they see as there's these books where they've had spiritual experiences which are have inspired them to become the people they are now. Well and do you I have any particular advice for that? Monica, I, I think that really what Julie and Jamuna were speaking of uh, is exactly um, is very germane because if you're speaking about something that's as personal as a spiritual experience, um, certainly you're going to feel a vulnerable. And, and and worry that that your words or feelings are going to be used against you. I don't see that happening very often in real life. I, I find that when you're uh, open and honest and vulnerable, people reciprocate. I know we're scared of the worst scenario, and and, and for very good reason. You know, self protection. I just don't see a lot of it. I see people go, well, okay, and I I, I don't think people care enough to be honest to, to uh, take your beliefs and throw them back into your face. So I know there's a danger there, but my advice to people would be the same advice that we just talked about. What other people think about your work is none of your business. You're, this, as I mentioned, being a columnist, you're on an island and someone is gonna, that plane is gonna fly over and it's gonna drop that bottle and that parchment. You're gonna throw it into the water and you're gonna wait for the next plane. That's it. Yeah, so the idea is to write what you what you enjoy writing and share things that are helpful and add the backstory so that people can understand where you're coming from and how you got there. And then as, as Julie mentioned, lots and lots of advice and tips because that's really what we're looking for, right? We need, it's great that you have an idea, it's great that you have a backstory, but I need to know how to implement that. So you need those three things. What I like about what Julie was saying is that, is that it sounds like she has a lot of the third category, a lot, a ton of that. 
which is great. So that's that's really helpful. It sounds like that. It sounds. Julie, forgive me if I'm misinterpreting it, but it sounds like it's pretty well already written. It's just a matter of putting it out there. So you've got it on most of us. Any more comments or questions? So you mentioned something that I thought was interesting. You wrote children's books. What were they about? They're about the alphabet. So uh, the Canadian alphabet books. Uh, so uh, it's called one is the big one is called Animals per Maple. And it's uh, it's about different letters in the alphabet and Canadian stories that go with it. So A is for Anne of Green Gables, which is a lovely Canadian story. B is for Banting and Best, who invented insulin. And so C is for Kim Campbell, because we had a, a female prime minister here for a few minutes. So, yeah, so that was really fun. That's that takes me to different schools occasionally and uh, and helping kids with their writing and talking about Canada. So that's a great gig. How did you choose illustrations? They, the funny thing about that process is they choose the illustra illustrator, which I was very lucky. I had a great illustrator. They choose it, but uh, it's really not up to the writer. You do your part, they do their part. And then, and then hopefully it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, uh, it worked beautifully. I had a, a, a wonderful illustrator work with me. Her name was Melanie Rose. Just a very, very talented, talented person. So I was very proud to have my words beside her art. Yeah, that's a good one. It works out. <laughs> there's uh, there's authors, of course, who illustrate their books themselves. Must be nice as to well. have talent. Must be nice to have talent. So this this writing all your life and sharing in this way has it made you stronger as a human being because you are so willing to be vulnerable and so on well i was thinking about this it's funny you would ask I, I was thinking about this yesterday and it's a bit of a twist um sometimes you, you don't write because you want to you write because you have to and people always say don't do it because you have to do it because you want to sometimes it's the other way sometimes you feel a, a real compulsion to write it so yeah, I think that writing has been instrumental because when you when you hear yourself talk in a conversation like this, or when you sit in front of the terminal, and or when Jimena does her her poetry, or when Julie sort of goes over a draft, you're you're reaching, you're refining your point of view, right? You're sharpening what it is you want to say, and and that uh, that can't be a negative experience, really. It has to be a positive experience. So yeah, it does sort of uh, the act of it writing about your life certainly sharpens your own. I guess you look at kind of in the third person, right? You, you sort of look at yourself in, in that way. So what we were talking about with Julia, about what she would say to someone coming in with those questions. So yeah, I, it has benefited me, I think, enormously. And it's also, and this is not incidental, put food on the table, Monaco, for, for almost 40 years. It's It's been my livelihood. It's the only thing, only commercial marketable skill I have, I think. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting, right? <laughs> to reflect on that, yeah. So, let's see. I think we can go a little bit into the art of writing. You already mentioned the specific areas that need to be covered in a good book, right? Um, according to your experience and what you've seen on the market, I bet. Yeah, I sort of, yeah, it took a lot, lot, of, lot of observation, but yeah, it sort of took a long time to distill it into those three points. So the the next thing is language, right? Because you were the words you choose and so on, and how how that that inspires you, right? To to write a good book, you need you need. You need to use language. And what is your experience with the language? How how sophisticated, how how few words you should use or all these things? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, a couple of things. 
a lot of people use a thesaurus. Uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the thesaurus because it, you're looking for words that aren't native to your language. If you have to look it up, don't use it. Use the words that you know because that will ring authentically if you can use that word. So that's really, really important. Um, the other thing is that, that, and this is, adjectives don't drive the bus, verbs drive the bus. It's the power, the power of the sentence is the power of the verb. The adjective, think of it like snakes and ladders. The adjective is the snake, the verb is the ladder. It's what really powers you. Um, and, and, and a great verb is super, super essential. Adverbs, forget it. Adjectives, really, you don't need them very much, but you need great verbs. So uh, discovered is not as great a verb as colonized, colonized, which unfortunately is what discovered often is in, in human history. Uh, so um, good is, uh, um, I could list your verbs. Uh, observe is good, and noticed, but noticed is probably better than observe. Uh, so there's just every verb can be improved upon. And when you improve a verb by 10%, you, you improve your sentence by 50% because it just, it just supercharges it. You know, a great verb is just, because there's only one great verb that's perfect for it, but there is one and the odds are you didn't get it on your first go. So, so going back and, and, and writing, of course, is rewriting. It's just constantly, constantly trying to make it better. A good, uh, they say a book isn't finished, it's surrendered. And I think that's really true. Um, it just comes to a point where you can't look at the damn thing anymore and you have to get rid of it and move on to the next project. But it's, it's, how, it's your tenacity in making the book better that's really important. The third element is, that I think is really important is, is in editing. Really, you should have your book edited by someone who knows what they're doing, does it for a living, because your friends and your mom aren't going to tell you what you really need to hear, because that's not their job. But an editor is the, often the purveyor of unpleasant truths, and and uh, and that's what you're paying them for. The problem, the thing, the most vexing part of writing that I've always noticed is that if you make one or two mistakes, it's worse than not having sat the keyboard at all. Sometimes I would write something that was really good and put my heart and soul into it, but then I made such a dumb mistake that the reader actually thought less of me, less of me, even more of me, even though I got up and I did this and I went to this event and I did all these things. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's really essential too, is to have a really great editor. Okay. That's nice to hear. So the, the beauty of it is, is to, so you were saying you are so happy when you've completed a book, right? When you've finished. <laughs> and the the joy in the process is, is can fluctuate, right? Oh man, writing is hard. Like writing is really hard. You know, I've got lots of advice, but I sweat it at the keyboard the same way anybody else does. You know, I just wish there was an easier way to to make a living. I never should have given up the male modeling. That's where I go. That's where I think I went wrong. If I just stayed as a male model, I could have, you know, it could be such a, but then there's the drugs and the destructive lifestyle and all that stuff and eating disorders. So I'm glad I didn't do that. But no, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a tough, it's a tough grind. Anyone who tells you that, that writing is really easy to them may not be working at it hard enough because it's, it's, it's very difficult to find the better word when, when you're feeling a little tired. And it's, it's the analogy, I, just to go back to editing if I can, and this is for Jimmy and Julie too, is that when I, when I talk to kids, I, I, I play this game when I talk to kids in schools. I, I say to them, um, can you see my bald spot? And they say, uh, yeah, because I got a bald spot in the back of my head about the size of Peru, right? And, and they say, yeah. And I said, no, really, can you see my bald spot? And they say, yeah. I said, no, really, can you see my bald spot, right? And, they, now they're just in full voice. They're yelling, yeah, yeah. And then I say to them, well, that's odd because when I brush my teeth in the morning, I can't see my bald spot. And so that story amplifies the idea that point of view is as important as anything in terms of what you see. And, and that's absolutely true with your own work. You're not going to see the stuff that is wrong because you thought it was right. 
<laughs> you wouldn't have written it wrong on purpose. You thought it was right. And so it takes that other person to look at it and go, ah, we can make this better. And that's really, really essential. So to go back to the editing point, yeah. And to go back to the difficulty of writing point, that's why it's so hard because you're, you're, you're working so hard to give the editor less to do. How about working with characters? I do not, Monica, I do not write fiction. I, I've never written fiction. I've worked with a lot of characters, but they were real people. <laughs> but I don't write fiction, so I, I can't, I've tried to write fiction. I, I, I don't mean to sound belittling. I am, would be the worst fiction writer ever. I don't even read fiction, except for maybe suspense novels, that sort of thing, just to sort of occupy my time. It's, uh, it's developing characters and doing that. I have so much admiration for people who can do that because I just, not if my life depended on it, could I do that. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting because writers who do that, they often get this feeling that the character gets a life of its own. So I was I wondering whether you had that as well. <laughs> I have heard that. I have the process. That's the process that it has a life of its own, as I mentioned, that it's sort of somewhere else. But uh, yeah, I've heard, I have heard that too, that people say that, that that person just had that destiny. I think John Irving said that he invents fascinating people do terrible things to. And <laughs> I guess that's the game. <laughs> okay. Then... Is there a question I should have asked that you'd like to answer? Mm, I guess only how can people get a little help and how can they, uh, how can they reach me? And that's easy. Uh, they can email me at mike at ulmer, U-L-M-E-R, ulmer.ca. There actually is an ulmer.ca. Or they can go to my website, which is getcatapulted.com, uh, and they can book a little time, and hopefully I can give them a little a little free advice. And then if, if they want to move a little further with it, then we can do that too. Yeah, you'll give me those links and I'll put them in the show notes. You got a deal. Perfect. So I would like to thank you very much for this conversation and how many points we covered. I think we covered a lot of points and I'm, I'm another curious question is You've been on quite a few podcasts, I think. How has yeah. that been going for you? How did you like that? Uh, well, I was on a pay-to-play podcast, which was just terrible, just a terrible experience. I sort of violated my principles to do it. <laughs> and uh, and it was just a terrible experience. But I love podcasting because I can just, it's its just fun for me to, uh, to drop in and, uh, and to listen to what other people are saying and to hopefully help a little bit. So, yeah, it's fun. I got, I think I'll done about 10 by the time this airs and it's 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 a lot of fun because people like julie I, I hear julie's story quite a lot she's in a different stage of development in terms of her book but i do hear that story that that people don't feel entitled to write their their, their book and and I, I really want to encourage them uh because they are because no one else can offer that story no one else on the whole planet can offer the story that julie will bring and Jamuna will bring. And that's not bad. Yeah, that's that's really important, right? To realize that each and every one who chooses to tell a story is entitled to do that, right? Yeah. We we lie to our kids. We tell them that they're not a little while ago I did a little singing gig. My wife was and a friend with her. They were terrified. They were just singing sort of background to me, and I was just wailing away because I have no, con I'm not brave. I just have no concept of repercussions. <laughs> and and so um, I realized how how harrowing it was for them to sing because somewhere someone told them they can't sing, and I asked them about it, and it was true. Both of them were told that they can't sing. We lie to our kids. We tell them these ghastly lies. And it's not true, of course. Anyone can sing, uh, and and anyone can write, and and we tell them these ghastly lies. And because they came from positions of authority, grown-ups when they were little people, they just not only did they absorb them, but they built upon them. 
it was like there's this seismic fault that somebody implanted in the base of their foundation. And the bigger and heavier they build the house, the bigger the fault becomes. And, and it's just not so. It was never so. And so the chance to sort of disimbue people from that really faulty conclusion is the best part of going on people's podcasts. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that, that one can share so much, right? And, and people can gain from this sharing, right? Yes, it's really great. I agree with you. It's, it's a lovely thing. Plus, I get to talk and talk and talk. Who doesn't like that? Yeah, and another thing is talking is also writing, right? That's what some people don't know, right? Because if you could talk, you could you could write, right? <laughs> So. What a brilliant, that's such a good observation. Yeah, if you can talk, you can write it. Yeah, dictate your book. There's plenty of people. There's rev.com. They'll take that and they'll absolutely make a transcript for you. There's your book. Yep. So that's that's also something to think of, right? Sure. <laughs> so that's easier to talk, right? I know. I Why not? That. Why not, right? <laughs> okay. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for participating, for listening. And I, I really sincerely believe there's a lot of content here to pick up on. And please review the podcast, spread the word and subscribe so that more people find it. So Jamuna, thank you once again, you Mike. Thank you, Wanako and J Jamuna and Julie, good luck.